first letter of Thessalonians. Uh, Paul is writing to this church with a thankful heart. And he's writing to commend them because of, of who they are and because of the church they are. Uh, Paul had planted this church on his first missionary journey. If you, uh, I'm sorry, his second missionary journey. If you remember, he went to Thessalonica and he preached and there, many of the Jews were saved, uh, and Gentiles, and then there's some Jews came from uh, another place and came and caused a bunch of trouble, and Paul had to slip out of town. And uh, they were, didn't like what was taking place in that early church. And so Paul left Timothy there to set things in order and to teach the church, and Timothy has now come to Paul and given him an update on the church. And this letter is Paul's response to what Timothy told him about that church. And it's one of the few letters uh, in, the, in the New Testament that Paul wrote where there is really no uh, discipline issues. In fact, this letter is all a commendation. He's thankful and he's commending them for who they are. And so uh, let's, let's read it together. We'll begin in chapter 1. Uh, and we'll read all 10 verses of this chapter. If you will, would you stand with me in honor of reading from God's Word. And may God bless it to our hearing and our hearts today. The Bible says, Paul, Silvanus, that's Silas, and Timothy, to the church of Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all. That we know Paul was from the south for y'all. Making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering. That word remembering means to, to keep in mind. Without ceasing your work of faith your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. And as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became examples to all who are in Macedonia and Archaea who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Archaea but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. You've preached your own testimony, so to say. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and now you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Father, I ask you now to add your manifold blessings to the reading of your word. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher as we glorify you for a church that is a pastor's joy. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm preaching today on the subject of pastor's joy. Now Paul was not a pastor. He was a church planter. But this church caused Paul to have great joy because of their character and because of their clear testimony. He's commending them. This ancient church had a witness in their community and people saw them and understood who they were based upon how they conducted themselves. Now I want you to know today, every church has a testimony. A church can have a good testimony or a church can have a bad testimony. Now I'll tell you one of the worst things that can ever happen to a church is when they get a testimony 
that they don't get along. It just creates people that never attend that church know about that. But uh, one of the greatest things, uh, at conversely, is that when a church has a testimony that they love one another and they love God and they love others. And I want you to know that's the testimony this church has had uh, for uh, seven and a half years. Is it seven and a half, eight years? I don't know, since 2007. I've lost track of time. But God has blessed us here in such a way that there's always been peace and harmony and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that is, that is the, to God be praised today. You know, it's great to come into a new building and to get on property that we're not paying rent for. But to God be praised for a people who get along and love one another. Can you say amen? amen. That is God's handy work. We've been blessed with that. And I want to say it's because of people like you who have sacrificed and loved and never wanted to have the first place but was always willing to promote others above yourself. You have lived out the New Testament principle today. And so I just come today to say praise God for you, the members, the congregants, the people who attend in Mayhus Baptist Church. See, they conduct themselves uh, in a, such a way in that early church at Thessalonica that people knew about them and it caused Paul to have joy. And I want you to know today, I have joy in my heart today just being your pastor, just being a part of this congregation. And so quickly today, I want to talk about three things as we think about a pastor's joy. First of all, we're going to think of, talk about a church's work then we're going to talk about a church's witness. And then we're going to talk about a church's walk. Well, a church's work. What, is, what does that mean? Well, verses 3 through 7, we see there that Paul points out that he remembers without ceasing uh, your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. He's describing the work of salvation, the work of saving faith that had taken place in their lives. Now, faith, I, I'm sorry, salvation is entirely by the grace of God. It is a work of God, and no one can earn it, no one can achieve it. You can't be a good enough person, and let me say, you can't be a good enough church member to earn salvation. But the church should be made up today of saved people. And then when you're saved, you want to be a part of God's kingdom and God's work. And so faith is, a, is an act of the heart and the mind that God can use and glorify. And so uh, as he talks about this in verses 4 and 5, he's describing salvation. You see, in the Father's eyes, I was saved before the foundation of the world. The Bible says he gave his son before the foundation of the world. Before this world was ever made, God already made a plan for my salvation and for your salvation. Isn't that refreshing today to know? You may be wondering today, can I really truly be saved? Well, I want you to know God's already got a plan. He made it before he created the world for your salvation. In the son's eyes, I was saved when he died on the cross. We sang that song, Worthy is the Lamb, whose hands were pierced, whose uh, side was pierced, and his, he wore that crown. He was put on that cross. I was saved when Jesus died on the cross, according to Romans chapter 6. And in the eyes of the Spirit of God, I was saved when he drew me to himself. Back in 1979 at Olivia Baptist Church, I heard the gospel, the Holy Spirit, began to work on me and draw me and I got the sweaty palm syndrome and I got the nervous twitch and I wanted to run out of there and get to the bathroom or do something to get away from what was ha what was happening and uh, but God uh, that through that day through the spirit drew me to himself and I was saved that day and I want you to know I've been saved ever since that day God I've never lost it I've never uh, wandered from it. I can't get away from it. In fact, the goodness of God says that He follows me everywhere I go. You see, if I go this way, He goes right with me. 
You know, there's been times that I've went the wrong way. How about you? There's been times that I've said, you know what? I believe I can go over here and I can act this way. And even though I'm supposed to be saved, I can do this. You know what? God came after me. He stayed right with me. And he reminded me through the power of his spirit. He said, you're saved. This is not any fun anymore. Aren't you miserable doing this? And I said, yes, I am. And I'm just as quick as I can. I want to get back over here where God wants me to be. You see, there is a work of God that takes place in salvation. But there's also the work of serving faith that we saw there. He talked about their labor of love. That word labor has a means a, a weary toil involving sweat and effort. A saved people is a busy people. If you're saved, you want to work for it. You want to be a part of what he's doing. There's no time to sort of just lounge around. You want to be a part of his labor because you are saved. It causes you to want to work. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are God's masterpiece. We are his workmanship that he will show forth in ages to come. You know, one of these days, if time tarries, I'm going to leave this earth, and you are too. And Lord willing, Emmaus Church will still be here. And some of us say, well, who started Emmaus Church? And what was that early church like? And maybe, wouldn't it be great that somebody looked back and say, boy, that early church loved one another. That, that first group of Emmaus, I, those first First Emmaus members, they loved one another and they sacrificed and they gave their tithes and their offerings and they gave to their vision for a place to pay for it and secure it and they built buildings so that we could come in and worship here. You know what? Our, we're, our salvation is a serving faith. But you know, it's not just something that we serve for the future. It's something we serve today. In fact, uh, Tammy and I were talking last night. We were talking about uh, those in the church who serve. And, I was, and, and we were just talking about names back and forth. And I was saying, well, yeah, they do that. And they do this. And they do that. And they do this. And, and you know what we discovered? We have a serving church here. Everybody here that's a part of this congregation, they, they find a place of service and they get into it. You, you say, but all I do is clean the floor. Hey, that is a great place of service, I want you to know. All I do is, is take care of the babies during, uh, during church sometimes. Hey, that is a great place of service. You're making a huge difference. You're loving on a child and, and caring for those that are precious and making it available so a mom or a dad can hear the Word of God. So those who love God, those who are part of the church, they tend to serve. And the Bible says here, in this verse, he says you're a laborer of love. It's born out of love. You know why we do what we do? Because we love God who first loved us. You know why we do what we do? Because we love our church family. We love the people we serve with. You know what? why we do what we do? We love those who we do not yet know. You see, this church is about those who we've not met yet. They're new friends. They're out there. They're in the highways and the byways of this community. And we're here to love them and let them know that God loves them. You see, our faith should be a saving faith, but it should also be a serving faith. And then I'm so thankful today that our faith is a sustaining faith. It'll get us through the tough times. It'll be with us. He talks about there in that verse that we will have patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What that's describing is that we will have a hopeful endurance. The hope that, that you know what, today might not be a great day, but tomorrow things may turn and be great. And you know what? The God who got me through yesterday will get me through today. And the God who got me through when this terrible thing happened in my family will be there when this next bad thing happens in my family. We have a hopeful 
enduring. And I'm so thankful today to be a part of a church that works. Emmaus Church, your church, who you are. We are a church that works. Amen? Amen. Number two, not only uh, a pastor's joy doesn't only come from the church's work, but it comes from a church's witness. I talked about how they had a, 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 a witness and they had a, a, you could call it a reputation. A bad reputation is a bad thing, but a good reputation is a wonderful thing. Paul said their reputation was so much in, in verse 7 that they were examples. The word example means uh, that it refers to a metal stamp or a type. It, it's kind of what you would use to mint a coin when they would take a piece of metal. Uh, uh, let, me, let me make it real easy. How many of you remember those pennies? That you get at the fair, that that you can get in that machine, and they put that top in it, they put that stamp in it. That's what he's describing. That we have a stamp. Our witness is a stamp. We're known by who we are. These people in this first church at Thessalonica, they had a witness. They weren't all evangelists. They weren't all pastors. They weren't super saints. But you know what? They were people who loved others. And it was made known in their life. You see, the church's witness, it comes, first of all, from the message of their witness. He says the word of the Lord there in verse 8. Look at it with me. He says, from, from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. You see, it's good to talk about our church. It's good to talk about Emmaus Church and the church that loves one another and all the good things that we know. But you know what? The greatest thing we can talk about is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That He loved us so much that He gave His one and only life for us and that through believing in His name we can have life also. It, by, by accepting Him and receiving His love into our life then we can have love to give away to others. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel. That's our message. That is the witness that really matters out here in the community. And by the way, that's the witness that this community really needs, isn't it? You think about it. how much people need to know that somebody really loves them. You see, our schools are full of kids. It's a sad day when they wonder if my parents really love me. I'm not trying to say all parents are bad. But in situations where, that are real life in our community, where kids have parents who are influenced by, by things that, that are not good, and the kids are put second because of their need for a drug or their need for alcohol, or their need for affection by someone else. Kids are sacrificed in this modern world. And they wonder, does anybody really love me? Does my mom really love me? Does my dad really love me? You know what? That same little child grows up. And they give themselves to somebody. And then you've got two somebody who don't know how to give love or how to receive love. And then they wonder, why does my wife not really love me? Why does my husband treat me like this? You see, love is the greatest message that we can take. The message of God's love through the Word of God. So the message of the witness. I could stay there a long time. But then we think about the method of this witness. The Bible says it was sounded out. It was made of raw, sounded for. In other words, it was so clear that people heard it from far away. You see, the greatest light shines the brightest at home, but it continues to shine out further and further. You know, I'm so thankful here today that in, 19, uh, in 2007 when we started the church, we didn't know that 
my daughter would be in Japan. And you know what she said? Think of a lot of you. Above and beyond your time, under no curse, but you said, you know what? I want to give. She could be there. You know any man's churches in Japan today? But not just with Hannah, but Brett and Jenny, they're back there today. A man's church goes all over North Georgia. For those of you that support and give to their ministry. But not only those that we know, but we have missionaries who are all around the world. In fact, we have over 5,000 international missionaries. That each week, when you drop a dollar in an offering plate, a percentage of that goes, and there's people hearing the message of the gospel in India and China and Thailand and Russia and Hungary and every region of the world. You say, well, what if they're not open to the gospel? You know what? We have missionaries there. They're there. They're working as a goat herdsman and building relationships. They're doing things like that and starting churches, getting Bible studies together and sharing the message, message of the gospel. It's, our method is, is spread abroad. But you know what? The greatest thing we can do is spread it abroad right here through our own mind. And then the ministry of this witness. It, it, everywhere Paul went, people knew about this church. Think about it. In the Macedonian Archaic, where Paul went, they said, Oh, Thessalonica. Well, that's that group of people who got saved and turned from idols. And they are following your teaching. And they are imitators of you. And they're following Christ. They are, they are the real deal. That's what was happening. Their ministry went further and further and further. And so when I said earlier that we're just starting, there's no end, no limit to the ministry that a local body of believers can do when we truly love them. Work together. And I'll say, follow the leadership of God called me. You know what? I, I, I got to give a plug, a, a, a rose here for uh, the leadership in this church, particularly the deacons. Uh, you know, we meet sometimes and, and we'll talk about something, and, and, and uh, some of us say, well, what about this or what about that? But at the end of it all, I always say, well, you're the pastor. I can't tell you the times I've heard Rick Gale tell me, you're the pastor, whatever you say. Yeah, that, don't, that don't happen out here at Baptist churches, amen. <laughs> and so, uh, it, it makes me leader. Makes me want to pray to make them Because they've always been so willing. But not just the deacons. But the deacons' wives, and trustees, and leaders who have followed me. And I can't tell you, even through this building process, so many of you have just said, okay. You didn't ask questions. And if I said this, they said, okay. And, and you said, okay. And it, it's refreshing. It's a pastor's joy. And so, you know, y'all said this is Pastor Appreciation Day. But well, I just want you to know I appreciate you. But let me say one more word and finish. Not only a church's uh, uh, work and a church's witness, but a church's walk. Look at verse 9 and 10. I want you to see how he described their walk. He says, that they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You know what he's saying? Is they had a holy walk. They didn't halfway do Jesus. There was no casual Christianity. 
It was either they were all in or all out. And when they got saved, they sacrificed. They, they turned, they gave up their idols. And they said, we're going to follow Jesus. And nothing declares God's power to save to the lost world more than a, a believer who will truly let his life shine. You see, you know what? That's what I used to do. But that's not what I do anymore. And so the future is bright for us because of you who live a holy walk. But not only do we have a holy walk, we have a hopeful walk. He talked about there in verse 10, to wait for the Son from heaven, that Jesus is coming again. And, and you know, sometimes we can say, well, you know, that's just an escape from where we're at today. Do you know that? That word wait it is an active word. It's not a passive waiting as if we just sort of just stand by. In fact, Jesus told his disciples to occupy or do business till he came back. In other words, our waiting is an active waiting. We are doing what Jesus asks us to do until he comes. It makes me think of that old song, Brother Mike, that says, We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. And I want you to know. That's my desire. If I make it to, to, to 70, I want to still be working. If I make it to 80, I want to still be working. And, and, and let me paint another rose. Brother Archie, <laughs> he get, I get down here, uh, down here working. Come, I come in about 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock, sometimes later, depending on what was going on. And look up there on that hillside, and old Archie been up there since daylight cutting weeds off of that bank right up there. Nobody asked him to do it. Nobody had to pat him on the back to do it. He said, I want people to be able to see me as they come down the road. I want them to be able to see this. And I, we were talking one day about where the line was and, and uh, some of those weeds and things were way over on the other side of our line. He said, they won't mind if I cut them. I said, no, I don't think they'll mind. He's been cutting weeds on the other end's property. <laughs> See, it's an active walk. We're looking for the Lord to, re to return. But we're willing to work until that takes place. While we're looking for Him, we'll say it in three ways. First of all, we should be active. Secondly, we should be clean. 1 John 3, 3 says, Everyone that has this hope in himself, purifies. All the while working to let God cleanse us and to live a more holy life. And it should finally should be a joyful way. A joyful way. We look forward to it with joy. I know some of you like me have looked forward to getting into this building. And I was just and I am overwhelmed with joy today. But you know, as I served him, uh, one night this past week, uh, we had gotten them just about things that we were going to get done here this week. And I lay down at night and I began to think about the next bill, you know, that next phase of this operation. And I couldn't go to sleep that night. I stayed awake for hours just thinking about that next phase. He said, what are you trying to say? Well, I'm saying, as long as we've got breath in our body, we should always want, be wanting to do more. More to reach people. More for His kingdom. More for our church family. More uh, of obedience. More of Jesus, I would know. More of His love to show. And so from this passage, this chapter this morning, we can see, you can break it down three or four ways. You can say, it talks about the elect. Those people who know God. The people who have been saved in verses 1 through 4. Have you been saved? Oh, I know you're a church member. You're a regular attender. You also know that the church roles are full of people who have never truly trusted Christ. 
I'd love for you to be saved today. Not for me, or not even for this church. I'd love for you to be saved today for you. So you can experience what I've experienced about Jesus. But then secondly, we see in verses 5 through 7 that these people were an exemplary people. They were exemplary. Do you live an exemplary life? Can others look at your life and say, you know what? I want to be like him or her because they're following Jesus. Paul said, you were imitators of me. In fact, Paul says it three times in the New Testament. Be imitators of me. And I want my life to be that way. I want you to be able to imitate me. Not because I want you to be like me, but I want my life to look enough like Jesus that if you follow me, you'll follow Jesus. Are you after that? Or have you got casual about your faith? It would behoove you today. And it would be for your great joy if you turn loose of the reins today and, so, and, and, and come down to this old altar and say, you know what? I want to be like Jesus. I want to live a life that's an example. An example to my family. An example to my kids. An example to my wife. By the way, I think a lot of lives would be changed with dads and husbands who live exemplary lives. Finally, he says not only elect people and exemplary people, but verse 8 talks about being an enthusiastic people. You know what? Nobody has to beg me to come to church. I say, sure, it's because you're a preacher. No, that's not the case. When I got saved in 1979, I begged to go to church. I begged God, let the car run. I beg God, give us enough gas money. I beg God to let me go. See, I don't want to know all I do is keep the nursery. Praise God, He's given you something to do. But you're good. Enthusiastically. And then. Verse 9 and 10, we see that they were the expectant people. They were expecting that Jesus would open the windows of heaven. And he's going to come through the eastern sky. And he's going to take his people home. And he's going to say to those who have been faithful, well done, my good and faithful servant. And he's not going to say, you did it. Real good, David, like Brother Mike. Or you did it real good like this sister. No, he's not. He's going to say, well done, because God's got a way and purpose for every one of us. We've each got a way. We've each got an individual personality. We're all unique. But all of us can serve him. And we can do it with our whole heart. And so because of that, there's nobody that's more important here today than anybody else. We're all one in Jesus. And so it's Pastor Appreciation Day, and I appreciate the sentiment. But I want to say to you, there's nobody here. more important than me. This is what we're supposed to be like. This is what gives a pastor great joy. And I know Brother Danny sat there and this, I preached this message. He, in his heart, he can say amen to everything I said. Because he hadn't always had it that way. He hadn't had a church 
who loved him like he loved me. They should. Well, I make my joy complete. You love them more better. You love them more than me. Pastor Dan, I still said it. I want you to know you'll have a happy birthday.